We're back now with Lorna Sixsmith, the author and blogger and uh, very well-known farmer um, of, of multiple books. This is your fifth book now, Lorna, uh, Till the Cows Come Home. Uh, can you tell us about it? Well, Till the Cows Come Home is a memoir. Um, it's focusing on three generations. So I'm looking at my dad's childhood, my childhood, and then I'm looking at what life is like now for my own children. Um, so it's covering three generations on the farm, really from the 1930s to the present day. And I suppose one of the things I was trying to explore was, you know, how much has changed in farming. Um, so much has changed in terms of mechanisation. Obviously, I cover up what electricity came in and the changes that brought in terms of being able to milk cows, um, you know, use electricity. But, you know, changes in community, changes in farmers helping each other, that still happens. Um, and I suppose I also tried to, to include, or I also did include, um, the work that my grandmothers did, the work that my mother did, and what I do. So sort of showing how the roles for farm women have changed somewhat as well over the generations. And Lorna, it's your, it's your fifth book, as we mentioned. Um, and you know, there's been very strong reaction to your books. There's a huge appetite out there uh, for farming, farming stories. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, I suppose the, for my first three books were quite funny. Um, in that, I suppose, I took a tongue-in-cheek look at what life was like for farming men and for farming women, but particularly for the woman who wasn't from a farming background and who was marrying in, because it was a whole, totally different culture to what she was used to. And I suppose why, why they were so popular was because people thought, this is exactly what my life is like, and I thought I was the only one that was experiencing things like that. So, for example, the fact when communication breaks down when you're separating cattle, um, you know, one of my tips is how to be telepathic, for example. Um, and people thought that they were the only only couples that were shouting each, at each other in the yard after working with cattle together. And then they discover, well, actually, that's quite common the world over. So I suppose what they did was that they helped, helped people to laugh at themselves. Um, and I mean, I've, I've done stands here at the Ploughing Championships in previous years, and I had one man come up to me, I remember it was two years ago, and he said, to, he bought my third book, and he said that when himself and his wife were working together, and she'll say to him, you're doing exactly what Lorna said in the book, you're not to do that, <laughs> you know? Um, and he said, then they stop and they laugh, have a laugh. So I suppose if we can stop people shouting at each other, it's a plus, isn't it? It, true, it is. Um, and Lorna, in the book, yeah, you detail about your life in the UK and then the move back to farming uh, down in, in Cretty Yard. Um, were you all, did you, did you envisage that you would eventually come back and do far, be a farmer? No, never. Um, you know, I suppose I was, I was the eldest daughter. There's two girls and a boy in our family. And I suppose, for one, I wanted to travel. So I suppose that, that didn't fit in with farming. But because I had a younger brother, I always just presumed that he was going to farm. So I never considered farming as a career. Um, my husband was the second son, and the farm wasn't big enough. So he knew he wasn't going to inherit. So he went off to college. So we were living over in the UK. I was a teacher, and Brian was a scientist. And we've been living there for 12 years. And then my younger brother decided he didn't want to farm. And my dad offered it to us. He really, as so many farmers do, he wanted a child to inherit. He didn't want to sell the farm or lease the farm. Um, and we, we spent a year, nearly a year considering it. And we we're having our first child. Um, so it was a huge move from being nine to five, child free, living in a townhouse, you know, having weekends off. I was a teacher, so I had good holidays, to coming back with a young baby, living in a small community where everyone knows what you do. Um, and, you know, because we're dairy farming, it's the 24-7, it's, you know, you're, you're, you don't get the Sundays off either. So it was a huge change in lifestyle, to be honest. Um, you know, this year has been tough, I won't, I won't deny that. But, you know, it has been times this year when I've wondered why on earth. But, um, you know, Broadly speaking, it's been a good move, but yeah, it's, it's, it, was, it was a big change. And dairy farming is such a huge responsibility, mm. a huge commitment, and then you're also writing your books, writing your blogs, and you're very involved in the, the women in farming groups as well around the country. How do you balance all that and raise a family? I have to admit I'm a bit burnt out at the moment, Claire. I think this has been a tough year and I probably did two books in very quick succession. Um, so I'm taking a bit of a break at the moment, just for a few months, just to let the, the brain cells get creative again. But I suppose, I suppose one of the things is about being busy is that you can procrastinate about the things you don't want to do. <laughs> 
one of the advantages of it, you know. Um, and I'm certainly not a perfect farm wife when it comes to housekeeping. <laughs> And uh, Lorna, just on the on the women in farming groups, uh, again, they've gained huge momentum over the last few years. Uh, what, what do you think of the, how far it has come in such a short space of time? Well, I suppose one of our first aims when we set up the, 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 the Southeast Women in Farming group was that we wanted the media, we wanted women to be more represented in the media. Um, we sort of felt that every time a farmer was represented, a far, the farmer was male. You know, there was a picture of a male farmer. Um, and when our couple were, uh, sometimes when a couple were um, featured, um, she didn't get that much of a mention. So one of the things we wanted was to, to raise the profile of female farmers. And I think the media have really embraced that as well. You know, it, it's wonderful to see so many, so many women that have been featured, but also I think it's proven that women just had to be asked. And they said, yes, I will be photographed. I will talk about farming. Um, there's always been the line, women have been the backbone of Irish farming. And they have, you know, there's no, no doubt about it. There's that expression of a, a farm will survive a, a bad farmer, but they won't survive a bad farmer's wife. So, I, you know, I, I just feel that, you know, in terms of succession, but also in terms of visibility, uh, one of our aims is to make sure that women were there. And we're getting there, delighted to say. And I've attended lots of the, the meetings as well. You always have very interesting speakers and interesting exercises and uh, great discussion. You recently had Sally Shorthall over, who is an um, incredibly well-known academic uh, in the field of women in agriculture. Um, how did people respond to her? It was very positive, really positive, in that Sally Shorthall, who, who, who was um, employed to, to do some research into women in agriculture in Scotland, and I think one of, the, one of the most surprising pieces of research actually that she presented was the fact that they decided to do some women only training. Some people were hostile to it, they said we don't need it, it could be men and women being trained together. But in actual, so they decided to fund some women only training and see how it went. It was actually oversubscribed. And, and what they found was that women were going on this training and they were discovering that they actually knew quite a lot about it. So in, in many ways, that kind of gave them more confidence then, because they felt, I actually do know it, and, but I'm not afraid to ask questions, because I think what was happening, if it was a mixed group, they were actually nervous about asking questions and looking silly. You know? So over there, they found that the women-only training has been positive. I mean, Sally is continuing to work with us. She's coming over to Ireland occasionally, so she's coming to some of our committee meetings. And she's from Leash originally. She's from Leash originally, and she's got family there. So I think, and we're getting some funding, so watch this space, there's going to be some very exciting things happening, hopefully. And what about the response from the women uh, who, attend the, who attend the meetings, who take part, who participate, um, how have they embraced what you're well, doing? Well, I think some women are, you know, it's very mixed in some ways, in that some women um, like to come along, it's, it's the company, it's the networking, and that's what they want from the group. Where other women sort of see that um, they, that, you know, they want to, they want their daughters to have the equal chances as their sons, for example. Um, so, on one hand, it's a social outlet, which is important too, and in others, it is very much a case of getting involved and let's take this further and let's ensure that Irish women are as much as part of Irish farming as Irish men. And uh, Lorna, it's been a very difficult year as well, and on the dairy side in particular. Uh, how have you fared yourselves? We cut our second cut. Of, well, we took bales for our second cut of silage in July. So in a way, our third cut of silage was cut on Sunday, and went into the pit. We covered it Monday. So we just about have enough silage now for the for the winter, as long as the winter isn't too long. We've made some changes, and the bullocks are being fed on straw and meal rather than silage and meal. Um, but yeah, it has been a very challenging year. We were feeding, supplementing with silage for seven weeks during the summer. And it's not just the finances of that, it's the workload as well. Because it just, we felt like we were doing winter work all year. You know, it was happening in May, it was in July, it was into August. Um, so yeah, I'm not ashamed to admit that, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit burnt out after it all. Well, we hope you get um, a rest maybe sometime soon, <laughs> Lorna, um, and I'm not surprised at all the work you're doing. Uh, Lorna, thanks again for popping in to us. Thank you.